Hey guys, welcome back. In this video, I'm gonna be quickly going through some Amboss questions. I'll show you how I approach them real quick and how I learn from the explanations. So let's get started. So I usually like to start with the last sentence first. Which of the following elements is most likely to be absent from this patient's JVP waveform? Okay, so sometimes I actually like to look at the diagram first. So clearly this is a jugular venous pressure waveform and they're asking us which one is gonna be absent. Now let's let's look at the patient's condition. Um, two month history of intermittent dyspnea and dizziness. She has a history of mitral valve stenosis irregularly. So the first thing I should be thinking about here in mitral valve stenosis with irregularly regular rhythm is AFib. So of course guys, as you know, uh, in mitral stenosis, there is increased left atrial pressure because it's more difficult for the left atrium to empty blood into the left ventricle. And this this increased left atrial pressure would distend left atrium and predispose to arrhythmias such as AFib. So that's the first thing I should be thinking of. Now, of course, you should have the jugular venous pressure waveforms um, memorized. And I know that the first one here is A, which represents atrial contraction. So there must be a problem here because in AFib, the atria are not going to contract properly. So most probably, this is the absent waveform. So I'm going to just pick area one here. And yeah, okay, it's correct. Now, now I know, I know, I have all of this memorized. So, and I understand why I picked this correct answer. So I could just quickly go over the bullet points to make sure that I'm on the right track. I didn't get this by luck and that I understand the core concepts. So A wave, atrial contraction, absent and AFib, exactly what we thought of. Now, if you haven't seen the jugular venous pressure before, or you don't have it memorized well enough, you could quickly go over the other answer choices, just as a quick revision, um, to make sure that you um, understand each waveform and memorize them. So you could just quickly go over each one of them. Okay. So... Okay, this is a really short vignette. I'm just gonna start from the beginning. A 29 year old man is brought to the ER six hours after the onset of severe epigastric pain and vomiting, heart rate elevated, blood pressure low, diagnosed with acute pancreatitis, and fluid resuscitation with normal saline is initiated. Which of the following is the most likely immediate effect? Okay, so this seems like the important keyword here. Now, in situations like this, I always like to picture this in my mind, like imagine a real patient being injected with IV saline, what, what's the first thing that would happen from a physiological standpoint? I'm gonna quickly go over through the answer choices to make sure I know. Okay, now, now try and imagine it. So if you inject, you're gonna, of course this is gonna be injecting into the vein. So that's, that's important to know. You're injecting this into a vein, okay? So the first thing that's gonna happen is that you're gonna have increased blood volume in, in, in this vein. And then of course, you're gonna have increased um, venous return to the right side. Increased venous return to the right side means that the heart is gonna distend more. And um, this increased distension means it's gonna contract with greater force as per the Frank Starling law. Of course, if you contract with greater force, this means you're gonna consume more energy or oxygen. So this makes C the most probable answer here. Okay, so I just wanna make sure I'm on the right track. I didn't get this by luck and that I'm thinking increase in cardiac preload, stretching. So, so exactly, like, like we said here, I just looked at the bolded points here to make sure that um, I'm on the right track. Um, now, the good thing about AMBOSS here is that if you're not sure, the core concept here is the Frank Sterling mechanism. So if you're not sure of that, you could just hover the cursor and quickly remind yourself of what it is. If it's the first time ever you don't know anything about Frank Sterling, well, you could, for example, go into the um, article or uh, click on the diagram and read, read more about the uh, Frank Sterling mechanism. And actually the diagram is particularly important for this law. Okay, so sometimes in questions like this, as you could see, lots of people picked other answer choices. So you could quickly go over them and see why people picked those answers. I mean, B, for example, this is the one that most people picked. I'm actually quite surprised because uh, volume of distribution is a something pharmacological. 
it's related to it, it's something inherent in the drug and it doesn't change it's not a physiological variable that would change in such a patient so let's see why this is wrong okay okay so okay yeah so basically let's say you picked um, volume of distribution try and understand why volume of distribution is not the correct answer Okay, so let's see. Okay, in calculation questions, I like to begin with, of course, I would definitely recommend you begin with the last sentence because if you begin with the last sentence like here, they're asking for the ejection fraction. Now I know that I should be looking for variables um, that would give me the ejection fraction. Okay, so I just realized something. This is uh, This question is very similar to one of the questions I did, the multi-step difficult multi-step calculation video. So you're gonna see this in uh, my channel. So I'm not gonna go through this question because it's actually gonna take a lot of time to uh, explain this. So we could skip this. Okay, so personally, when, when, when I'm given um, ECGs or diagrams, I usually like to look at those first. So what I did here is I looked at this ECG and this seems like it's AFib. First of all, it's irregularly irregular and um, the most important irregularly irregular rhythm on step one and step two is AFib. So I'm thinking of AFib right now. Let's see what the... Uh, and of course, as you can see, there aren't proper P waves here. They're like fibrillatory uh, P waves. So in AFib, it's either absent or you have just those messed up waves like this. And of course, the irregularly irregular rhythm. So what are they asking for? Which of the following changes is most likely responsible for this patient's acute exacerbation of symptoms? Okay, so uh, I'm gonna go one step backward. Three months later, the patient returned the first thing. Okay, nothing really specific here. I'm gonna go and start from the beginning. Intermittent chest pain, dizziness on exertion. Okay, her pulse is blood pressure. Late peaking, okay, now now we're getting much more specific. Late peaking, crescendo to crescendo murmur, heard best of. This is classic for aortic stenosis, and echo confirms this as well. So. We're looking at uh, an aortic, aortic stenosis patient with AFib. So now they're asking, why is this causing an how How does AFib cause an exacerbation of symptoms with somebody who has aortic stenosis? Now, first of all, the patient's symptoms here, the intermittent chest pain and dizziness, is obviously because of the aortic stenosis. The, the stroke volume decreases in aortic stenosis because there's increased resistance, of course. So less blood is able to come out of the left ventricle into the aorta. So... Um, this explains why the coronary blood flow might decrease. Of course, uh, the right coronary and left coronary are actually the first branches. They're at the base of the aorta. So if you have decreased blood going through the aorta per unit time, this might decrease the blood flow to um, the heart and lead to chest pain. And the dizziness, of course, because of decreased blood flow to the brain. Now, for some reason, the patient has an acute exacerbation of symptoms, and it's because of the AFib. So try and imagine it. When you have aortic stenosis, this is gonna increase, it's gonna back up, of course, and increase the left ventricular pressure. Left ventricle is, uh, you're gonna get left ventricular hypertrophy over time, of course, and it's gonna increase the left ventricular pressure because the blood is l less able to come out of the left ventricle. So this is gonna increase the left ventricular pressure. And over time, you're gonna have left ventricular hypertrophy and increased left ventricular pressure will probably back up into the um, left atrium and over time, this could actually lead to AFib because of the distension of the left atrium. Now, normally, if this doesn't happen, if the patient doesn't have AFib, they depend on the atrial kick or atrial contraction to empty the blood from the left atrium into the left ventricle. Because, because the left atrium is facing um, a greater resistance when it's trying to empty blood from the left atrium into the left ventricle. Because as we said, left ventricle has greater pressure, so it's going to be more difficult for blood to pass from the left atrium and into the left ventricle. So it depends on atrial contraction to push that blood forward. So if you have AFib, again, there's a problem with atrial contractility. So you wouldn't have this atrial contraction or atrial kick to empty the blood into the left ventricle. So now the preload to the left ventricle is probably going to decrease, plus you have aortic stenosis 
which would exacerbate the patient's symptoms. So let's look at the answer choices real quick. Impaired contractility, I don't think so. Impaired pulmonary arterial flow, no. Increased, nope. Decreased left ventricular preload, like we said here. Now you lost the atrial kick, so less blood is able to get from the left atrium and into the left ventricle. So probably this is the correct answer. Okay, let me just make sure um, that we got this right because of, for the correct reasons. So I'm gonna look at the bolded points here. Okay, so the increase in diastolic pressure, the filling pressure, like we said, left atrial dilatation, which in turn increases the risk of AFib. And of course, if you have decreased AFib, this decreases left ventricular preload. Pre okay, so now we understand um, why this happened. Okay, so let's say um, we didn't pick this question, we picked 33% picked this. So let's say we picked this, now, I, I would try and understand why this is the incorrect answer. So, what's this decreased impulse conduction across the... Now, try and understand why you picked this and why it's wrong. And, of course, same thing with the correct answer. You go over it and understand why why this is the correct answer. And um, the good thing about AMBOSS here is that... Okay, so you get the um, overlay features and the captions for all the diagrams. For example, you're not sure of the AFib ECG, or maybe this is the first time you've ever seen an AFib ECG, you could quickly read the caption and understand what's going on here, and the overlay feature explains exactly um, what's going on. Okay, so that's it, guys. I hope you found this uh, video useful. Just something real quick to show you how I um, approach the questions and how I learn from the explanations. Okay, so um, actually, there's something I forgot to mention. Um, the reason I don't go, I personally don't go through the all the um, incorrect answer choices. Like I said, if I'm like I know any, everything about this question here, I just went through the bullet points and then moved on to the next question. The reason I don't go through every single answer choice is because it ends up being a form of passive learning. If you're just reading the incorrect answer choice, you're trying to understand why this is incorrect and then this is incorrect. It's a form of passive learning. You're better off spending this time solving other questions and actively learning. I feel like this is more efficient than um, passively reading why other um, incorrect answers are wrong. So yeah, that's it guys. Thank you for watching.